Welcome to Run With It, the podcast that brings you business ideas from established entrepreneurs. Each episode, you'll hear a new business idea and the exact steps our guests would take to get started. Follow through and you can earn a free mentoring session with today's guest and potentially a business partnership. Here are your hosts, Chris Justin and Ethan Janney. I'm Chris Justin. And I'm Ethan Janney. And on today's episode, we're going to bring you something a little bit different. Yeah, we did this live stream on Saturday, March 28th. It was very exciting for us. Ethan and I haven't done something of this magnitude before. It was four and a half hours of jam-packed conversation with eight different entrepreneurs. Called it the Recession Proof Startup Saturday. We got a lot of people hanging out at home now in quarantine because of COVID-19. And yeah, we're pretty proud that we were able to pull this together and make something positive out of difficult time for a lot of people. And we actually raised some money too. We raised some money, $415 at the time of this recording. And growing. Yeah, it's been growing over the past few days. So that's good. Been growing. Yeah. Also, I think a big appeal for us in doing this is to bring some optimism to people out there. Who knows what it'll feel like in a couple of weeks when this is published. But right now, today, uh, it's March 31st. And it feels a little dire out there. People are a little gloomy. And I think one of the most exciting things about this episode is the enthusiasm and positivity that a lot of the guests brought to it in the face of something that's very challenging, both from a health standpoint and the economy. And the uh, fundraiser, by the way, was for the World Health Organization COVID-19 Response Fund. So yeah, we got a lot of people taking threats and turning them into opportunities in the most positive way possible. And so I think listeners will get a lot out of this. Great. Let's hear about the next episode we're going to do. All right. Let's take a listen to Sam Davidson and Matt Verlinich. Sam. Hey, what's up, guys? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Loud and clear. Yeah, you guys sound great. Awesome. This is going to be interesting because we actually have Matt Verlinich coming back on the air slot. Fantastic. Almost like an update episode. Sam, would you mind giving our listeners here a little bit of context about who you are, uh, what your experience has been, and just uh, a little bit about your story. Yeah, you bet. Thank you guys again for having me. My name is Sam Davidson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Batch. We're a locally focused gift and retail company. We're headquartered in Nashville, Tennessee. And what we really specialize in is finding the best artisan, small batch, handcrafted items of a given city boxing those up and shipping them out wherever they need to go. We have, or uh, I guess had, hope to have again, our flagship retail store it was located just north of downtown Nashville in the farmer's market, but obviously closed until further notice. So in lieu of that, you can shop online at batchusa.com. We've got over a thousand items, again, all made by other small businesses, mostly in the Southeast. We've got some folks from all over the US. Then we have a whole line of corporate gifts as well. And so a lot of companies use us even now to send either at-home care packages or in lieu of a conference that's been canceled. But normally, in normal times, whatever those look like once we're we're out of this, we have a fun time kind of reimagining, upgrading, updating the corporate gift basket, if you will. Personally, I'm a four-time entrepreneur. Started my first company back in 2006, but obviously never faced anything like uh, this current pandemic that we're in. So I'm learning alongside everybody else. Oh, well, welcome, Sam. It's great to have you here. Yeah, great to talk to you again. Wanted to uh, give you a little bit of context for how this episode is different from the previous one that we've recorded. We're obviously focused on current events a little bit more than normal here. And uh, welcome, Matt. Good to see you. I I see you've got your quarantine beer going. (laughs) (laughs) I think I'm going to let it go. (laughs) It's time to invest in supercuts for the bump that they're going to get after the uh, <laughs> after the quarantine. <laughs> Matt, we just had Sam introduce himself. Can you give a little bit of background about what you do and who you are for those listening? Sure. My name is Matt Verlinich. I uh, am an engineer by training, but I, after working as a mechanical engineer, I got the chance to open and run the Pittsburgh location for a national international chain of makerspaces called Tech Shop. So I opened and ran that for three years before deciding to try to prototype my own product and launch and start my own business from scratch, which I did largely through a successful Indiegogo campaign that financed it completely bootstrapped. The product is a clear ice cube maker. Fill it off with water, put it in your fridge or your freezer, just like any other mold, and out comes 
clear cubes, spheres, or diamonds. Uh, I still run that business on the side as a essentially an e-commerce company while I now work for one of the nation's most active seed stage investors. It's actually a nonprofit, which is a really interesting model. Our primary mission is economic impact in southwestern Pennsylvania. So we run two internationally ranked accelerator programs, Alpha Lab and Alpha Lab Gear. One Alpha Lab is for software startups. Alpha Lab Gear is for hardware for physical product based startups. And I manage their manufacturing initiatives. So working on building out a network of manufacturers who are willing to work with startups, as well as trying to connect manufacturers to different innovative technologies that will help these US-based manufacturers be prepared for the future and be competitive in the world stage. Great. Yeah. I'm going to call out right away. You were, you've been in the makerspace field and we talked about you know people going out to try to help with the PPE shortage. And I've seen that there's now a movement uh, for kind of makers to get in there and help crowdsource creation of PPE for folks. I don't know if you've heard of that, but that might be something interesting that comes up here. Yeah. For the last two weeks, that's been pretty much consuming my time during the, the for the day job because of my network and experience. I had a lot of people reach out to me as well as working for Innovation Works because we're a nonprofit that's been around for like 30 years. We're really well connected into the uh, local foundation community. And so it's like, as well as both the major hospital systems in Southwestern Pennsylvania. So it's I've been trying to kind of help connect the dots between makers and manufacturers who are manufacturing different PPE alternatives. And so we can talk more about that comes up or. Yeah, sure. So I'll set the context a little bit here for us. We're going to try and think of brainstorm, spend some time brainstorming some business ideas that would be well suited for the environment that we're in for the uh, some of the restrictions that people may have right now with staying at home. And uh, yeah, we'll spend some time brainstorming it probably a little bit more time brainstorming than we did in the last episode that we did together, try and hone in on one idea and start talking through some action steps. So in the previous session, we kicked around maybe five or six ideas before we started really settling in on one and we maybe spend 10 minutes or 20 minutes honing in on it. So I'll give you guys a, a second here to think about a couple ideas or interests, musings that come to mind. I'm going to check in on the comments here again to those listening. We're encouraging comments. Matt, you've got a, a fan out there. Andy Ellis says, what's up, Matty V? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Chris Lacey had commented that he enjoyed the first session. So thank you guys for those comments. Yeah, thanks for being here, Chris. Chris was in the foundation as well, I believe. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. So I'll turn it to you guys. If one of you is chomping at the bit to share some ideas that you've been thinking about, feel free to jump in and brainstorm away. There are a couple of things out there just to get us started and see where things go. You know, one thing I've always found that in uh, starting a business, obviously, always to have a customer in mind. And so I first started thinking about who, you know, what are people buying? I think we're here on the front end of what for all intents and purposes looks like it's going to be a fairly wide and maybe even long recession. And so I think individual and business buyers uh, are going to be tightening their purse strings if they haven't already. But until then, or even if then, you know, one thing I think that keeps coming to mind for me and where my ideas started coming from was the idea that tens of millions of people now don't have a commute. And so to me, that's interesting for several reasons. But primarily, there are countless people who are now getting, what, an hour, two hours, some three or four hours a day back into their schedule. Uh, And so to me, that's very fascinating. Not to mention, my other assumption is that when people are working from home, they're able to I don't want to say waste more time, uh, be more efficient. But I think the little things in an office setting that take up your time, the side conversations, the trips to the water cooler, the, the chats in the break room, those have all largely disappeared unless folks are constantly on video like some are. So basically, if the average consumer now has three extra hours in their weekday, my mind goes to what are they or what could they be doing with that? So perhaps as a thought exercise, I want to throw that out there. Do you guys have any reaction to that? If not, I'll I can throw in a couple ideas of where it leads me to think from a business standpoint. But to me, that seems very fascinating that if people now have time, how are they filling that time? What are they doing with it? Matt, jump in. I think that's a really that's a really great point. And you see some of these like statistics that are coming out right now where now that people are spending more time at home, the all the streaming services, mm-hmm. YouTube, Netflix, everything, Zoom, 
everything is just going through the roof in terms of usage and traffic. And so there's a potential to think about that from an infrastructure play of if even after this, if people will leave their houses, how are all of these companies that have now so successfully transitioned so much of their workforce to telecommuting? I think there's going to be a lasting impact in that. And what is yeah. it going to take to what businesses or infrastructure investment would it take to support the probably inevitable growth of that trend? Yeah, and you would assume that. And, and that's what's exciting about getting you guys' invitation was not just to sort of brainstorm some pop up business that is only good for the next, say, six weeks, six months, but something that can also carry on, maybe with a slight pivot once kind of society's back to normal, whatever that new normal looks like. But I think, yeah, I think infrastructure, I didn't even think about infrastructure. So I think that's a, a great kind of direction to think about is from the digital standpoint, how folks, uh, A, just how all of these platforms are propped up, but even B, thinking about what percentage of companies will continue to work mostly remotely, if not entirely. I would think a significant amount, but again, I have nothing to base that on other than just sort of sitting here trying to think through based on how how well people are doing with this arrangement. Because most cities, I know uh, where I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, it's been about two full weeks now since everybody was kind of encouraged to stay put, non-essential businesses closed, that sort of a thing. And it's not nearly the shutdown that, that we've seen in other cities like New York and San Francisco. Uh, anyway, but I think it's a great, a great, great way to go. Yeah, I think a, a key concept here is people don't often change their ways of living in a wholesale fashion like this. And when people do that, it's an opportunity to influence them to gain market share with a new idea. It's a great time to jump in with creating new habits and, and that could be new tools. I was chatting with some of my friends uh, maybe a week ago and we had a, a Snapchat video session and I, I'm on Snapchat very rarely. <laughs> but uh, but we were all talking together, a bunch of friends from college. And I was thinking, we, someone had mentioned, like, it's a shame that it took this quarantine to have us all to have us all talk like this. So that exists on a personal level, but it also exists on a business level where I think is the same you brought up. Businesses are going to find out that working from home, allowing people to do remote work in a lot of ways, it can be better. Something Sam said too mm -hmm. about the, like the water cooler chat being gone and how this is kind of shaping or changing the internal culture of organizations and working from home. I think there's a really big opportunity there. I was just talking to a friend of mine yesterday who had recently just started to go out on her own as a freelance organizational psychologist. And she had been so focused on diversity and inclusion for a while, which is now something that has kind of not made the priority list on the budgets of a lot of these bigger companies. But she's equally poised to now try to tackle these other aspects of like, how do you foster and grow a corporate or a company culture, a team culture with everybody working remotely. So that's another interesting potential aspect of businesses or at least strategies for pivots of freelancers or service-based businesses or education professionals, so to speak. Yeah, I think the culture issue is huge. I mean, part of that is the, the whole proverbial water cooler. But I think you're right that there are... I've heard from folks just trying to figure it out. And I think most folks are getting a routine. Well, one thing I've noticed friend of mine commented who's fairly extroverted and probably someone, uh, you know, I'll have, I don't know, 10 meetings a week in person with people. And I'm way more exhausted after back-to-back -back video meetings than I am back-to-back in-person meetings. And some of that's just because the frequency is much higher and getting that that rhythm. The other is I realized I tweeted yesterday, I was like, you know, the the meetings that would have just been phone calls before all this can still just be phone calls. They, they don't need to, you don't need to dial a video just because you would have picked up the phone in your office. So I do think there's something on the um, sort of that cultural consultant, that sort of work at home consultant to help folks, not just from a tech standpoint, but from a, I mean, culture is the best word for it, but really trying to integrate that across people's homes, especially now it's not just working from home, but it's schooling at home. It's everything's at home. So you have other variables that you might not have uh, otherwise. I'll throw a couple things in here real quick, just to keep up with the chat here. Chris Lacey was saying that Amazon has cut back on HD 4K streaming because of the load for now. It's an interesting tidbit to throw in there. Another thing based on something Chris said a little while back is, is how people's habits are changing and how it's a good time to throw something in there that's different. The other interesting thing about that, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this idea that like a company like Target, they will just spend so much on marketing to someone who just got married or just had a baby, 
or has any other, you know, they just moved to a new city because there's also just something about human psychology that when we have a major life shift, we're also open to anything new. And so it's a potential, it's like a little bit tangential idea, but that was sort of introduced is that this is just generally a, a place where, you know, businesses could change, like who has the leadership role, you know, in a marketplace. Um, and people can come in and step in and really get a larger share of someone's brain because it's more open because of the flexibility here. Yeah. That's something I was thinking too, is because everybody is shifting these habits and they're starting to now be forced to do things that maybe they've been avoiding for a while, like meal delivery services or Uber Eats from different their favorite restaurants or uh, delivering food from grocery stores, even major chains. I know like around here that used to not do grocery delivery are now having to do grocery delivery. And so that's going to have a long-term impact. And like you were saying, shaking up potentially who is the market leader in those arenas. Got some thunder going on in the back. Yeah, that was great. What was that? <laughs> it gave uh, Matt's, <laughs> Matt's warning like this ominous toad here. So well. Let's continue kind of fleshing this out here for uh, what the opportunity is. One question that I've got for you, Sam, as someone who's built a relatively large business that has seen some impact from this, how would you feel about being approached from someone who's selling to you, uh, selling services? They're trying to help, right? They're, they want to bring about something positive. How do you think about that? I, I think two things. One, um, and I'm still taking sales calls if it's a hey, something that's going to save me money now or later. And so, for example, we obviously, we sort of essentially pivoted our in-person retail store to now online. So we spent the last 10 days getting all those items photographed listed out there. And obviously, I've seen an increase in online sales year over year, mainly because we've got a lot more items. We're running at discount because we have all this inventory we need to move somehow. And with no open date yet for our retail store, we got to move it somehow. We've already paid for it. And so I still need boxes, for example. So if you can give me cheaper boxes than I'm currently paying, awesome. Uh, and again, on the other side of this, when it's time and different, I'm still going to need boxes. So if you've got something that is going to save me money, especially now, that I still need now or will use in the future, great. Now, if you're selling me um, high-speed internet for my retail store or a new point-of-sale system, I'm not interested right now. I don't need it right now. I don't know when I'm going to need it again. So some of that is just knowing based on what you're selling, what you're offering, what the fit is. And so being sensitive to that. Yeah. Yeah. Follow-up question to that. What about... Um, I get the sense that business owners are really busy right now, right? They're, they're scrambling in order to uh, adapt to this new world. And some people may feel like like it'd be more difficult to get in front of a business owner. Uh, in that case, do you have any suggestions for how someone can attract your attention during this time where you're extremely busy? Yeah, I think part of it is, um, man, being really gentle. One thing I was thinking about in prep for this conversation is there's a lot of trust right now that could be earned, but then also a lot of it that could be burned in this stage. Because I think if you come with the same sales pitch that you did six months ago when things were great in a particular industry you might sell into, it just is not going to work. Either people have already been laid off or furloughed. They're not at their same office number. And so I think part of it is uh, now is where you've just got to try to be helpful. So to get in front of us, especially a small business owner, because most small business owners, they've cut staff or about to. They're completely stressed. Uh, they're figuring out just how to survive. Some colleagues I know are even contacting unfortunately, bankruptcy attorneys. And so uh, I've told a couple of folks who have, who have pitched anything from tax services to you name it, just said, hey, let's talk in October. Uh, nice. And those that respect that <laughs> will get time on my calendar in October. And those that don't, uh, won't get the chance to come in my inbox again. So it just takes way more tact and patience than ever before, but people have more time. And so uh, if it's going to take longer for you to craft that email or that phone call, that's fine because, like I said, you're not commuting and there's other things you're not doing now. So spend the time to make it right. Uh, because if you earn the trust now and if you say, look, we're here for you now, that's going to remain throughout this. And that's what we told our own sales team uh, is to be nice, be sensitive. And if somebody says no or don't talk to me, then that's fine. Go to the next person. But if you can find the right thing right now, you can have a lot of success still. I love that point. I think that that really, the situation really helps people. <laughs> it shows you true colors, right? It's uh, it's a lot harder to do that when when your back's against the wall. I want to read comment here. So 
we can jump back into the idea, but uh, Chris Braji commented, in my opinion, there will never be a substitute to grabbing four or five people on the spot and having a meeting to solve a problem. If everyone is working from home, there's a delay in trying to organize an actual meeting. So that could be good food for uh, thought for some of the discussion that we had earlier on about the business ideas. But I'll kick it back to you guys to kind of synthesize some of what we talked about. And I'm going to throw one more day, especially to get Matt's input on, given his background in makerspaces. Because the other day that came to mind, you know, we work with over 100 small businesses, small vendors, folks who are, are baking and making and all that sort of stuff. And I think we've all seen the, the platform masterclass where you get one of these world-class CEOs or experts and they're teaching a masterclass on their craft. So be it marketing or leadership or whatever that might be. So one idea I had was, could you get all these small businesses who have a focused expertise in chocolate chip cookies or making soap or candles or leather working? And could there be some masterclass equivalent where it's someone who's done this for 20 or 30 years, they're not super famous or incredibly well-known, but they've got expertise. And could you figure out a way to get their knowledge to show them cooking or making their seasoning in their kitchen? And so you can either try a version of that at home and obviously paying something for that because then these, these folks, especially that are making some sort of good that maybe they can still have some success selling online on their own platform or a large retailer. They're definitely offered from a lot of our vendors that for most of them, their, their wholesale accounts are completely basically on hold. And so is that a way for them to earn uh, revenue for their knowledge? And I know, Matt, you've seen a lot of that in, in your makerspace experience, folks who are making all kinds of things. You know, Could that be taught? Is there a platform out there where... Again, these people who are saving time from commuting, they say, hey, maybe this is the month I learned how to make the perfect cupcake. And so I'm going to learn from these people. That's a really great point and a great idea. I've I've been kicking around that ever since I was at Tech Shop. It's <laughs> like, how do you... Is it a platform that is the solution? Or is it a, a sort of service-based like concierge business? Because I find that it's a burgeoning industry right now. Like the online mm-hmm. course content, there's you know, Linda and Udemy and LinkedIn acquired Linda, I think. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember who Udemy is partnered with and Skillshare and Masterclass. There's all of these like kind of platforms that are doing that, but it's still in this early adopter phase and it's catering to the people who already have very much like digital, high digital experience, service-based providers, like people who have that comfort level. So either creating a tool or a platform that allows like every maker, Main Street business, artisan. I saw an ad on actually on Facebook for like 84-year-old Nona that teaches how to make pasta. Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, that is a very compelling <laughs> ad. And how I'm sweet. like, I want to take that class. <laughs> yeah. How yeah. the hell did she get that online? <laughs> I feel it's like a company that like approached her and was like, hey, we'll videotape it for you? Or is it just the platform is so easy to use that <laughs> anybody can do it? Well, I think it's what you would need. You would need you know, some organizing force that could help. Because again, a lot of these folks, they do what they do because they love it and they're good at it, but they don't have a skill set necessarily that lends itself to teaching or even to being in front of a camera. So that's where I think the business concept as organizing force to vet, produce some sort of ebook that you get with it for your fee, and really getting the knowledge out of their head and make it look good for film and, and get the content out there is I think I think a huge need because they have the knowledge, but they just don't have they they there's a reason they don't teach basically right now. Yeah, I just came across an old YouTube video that I loved. It's I can't remember this guy's name, but he is like a digital marketing professor, I think, in Columbia. And he has this one video which talks about the difference between audience and traffic. And how like a lot of people want to try to monetize traffic, but really the only people who successfully do that are like Google and Facebook. Whereas the difference is building your audience. And a lot of these like smaller and main street businesses or artisan businesses who have since previously relied so heavily on word of mouth and foot traffic and with the appropriate partnerships, either with retail or just their physical location have never wanted to make that jump to building kind of a digital audience, which they can cultivate and own. Something, a tool that I think would allow a lot of those businesses to do it is providing that real value of an educational content or an experience showing everything that kind of goes into the product that they create. 
but like you said, it's, there's so much to that, right? Like scripting and writing, graphic design, photography, video, editing, yeah. lighting. There's like all of these things that not all of these businesses have at their disposal. Or This is an idea completely out of left field that could complement this. But I'm thinking about the skill sets of people who are currently either out of work or low on work. And one that comes to mind would be a, like a talent agent. Right? Maybe there's someone out there who has an eye for like, this person's charismatic. I bet they can make a course that would really sell well. That may be location dependent. Right? Maybe you need to be in LA in order to be connected with people like that. But and New York has a bunch of talent agents. Well, actually, now, now what you made me think about is when you say out of work, obviously, you know, there's a lot of professional services folks that, that are unfortunately out of work. But then the other sort of large industry hit, obviously, is restaurants, hospitality. And so... What comes to mind for me is uh, the website Gold Belly that ships, you know, ribs from Rendezvous in Memphis overnight. And basically, you can get a restaurant meal that these restaurants are really known for. And again, I, I would think that they would be doing well, but still with a decreased volume because they don't have dining room traffic. But again, so if you could learn to make oysters like so-and-so makes in, uh, you know, Charleston or, or barbecue like this person makes at this Texas restaurant, and have them. So you have these folks who make goods that are on store shelves and you can make their sauce, but to actually make, you know, and again, it's never going to be quite the same. So I don't think you're stepping on their toes and, and they're never going to have customers again. But if you could get world-class chefs showing you how to make their signature dish, that's something that I think could increase the perceived value from, again, the person at home who's not go, not spending time going out to eat. Maybe they're doing a little bit of takeout. They're not commuting. They're also looking for something to do with their family, their, their spouses, their kids. So cooking together or making something together could be a great ritual. Uh, looking to fill just fill time in your day because you know watching four or five hours of Netflix uh, <laughs> a day is fine, but eventually I think everybody's going to overdose on that and and be looking for something else. Yeah, yeah. There's a um, a company and I don't know if it's a company, but there's a group in Pittsburgh where Pittsburgh restaurants are are putting together meal kits for people and and sending it out. I'm not sure uh, exactly how they're doing that, but we'll link to that in the comments. Got a question here. We'll take a, a quick interlude for a comment from Paul Sherman. What are you all hearing about SBA loans and incentives from the stimulus bill that was just signed? Are you or the companies you work with interested in SBA offerings? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in first because uh, my answer is yes with a question mark. So I've got it on my calendar tomorrow to wade through a lot of this now that the act was passed yesterday. You know, we at Batch have seen obviously a decrease in retail sales and without any sort of knowledge of when that's going to come back. While things have been good, okay, uh, shifting to online these last 12 days, again, we're expecting some some rough rides ahead. And so part of it, because the SBA loans, what little I've read so far, have some really great terms uh, and some really awesome benefits. We're, we're definitely looking into it. We've not got an SBA loan before. But we're definitely considering it and we'll be taking those steps probably in the next seven days. So yes. Good. No, well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Our tax dollars are going to businesses like yours, <laughs> not <laughs> just right. you know, big airlines that were milking printing money yeah, exactly. over the last that's right. That's right. Decade. That is something that's gonna be very interesting to watch unfold because it's happening so quickly and there's no experts in it yet. And everybody's just figuring it out as we go. It's I know it's caused it causes a lot of stress too, especially on the businesses that really need it that I've talked to. That it's like, I need this and I don't know how to figure this out. We've kicked around a couple of things here so far. Is anything jumped out to you guys yet for an idea that we can that we can dive deeper on? And it's okay if the answer is no. We can kick around some more ideas for another 10 minutes or so and see if something jumps out. I'm liking the ideas around just the the transitional what's going on transitionally, you know, that people are going through a change and, and there's a chance to, to get in their minds and, and change something up for them. You know, I'm going to throw in a couple more things and maybe it'll stimulate us up the coming up of people having to do layoffs and being super stressed out, people having to file for bankruptcy, you know, being the type of person that can come in there and you're a, kind of a layoff expert, you know, and you can come in there. And that is a very niche thing. It, it may not be scalable. But it is something that seems like it's in need in this time. Someone could just come in, hey, listen, I know you know you never were prepared for making this many layoffs at the same time. But you know, I've been through this many times. There's probably somebody like that, right? And we're gonna walk you through it, you know, and people are gonna come out and you're not gonna be a monster and you know, we're gonna find a way to make this happen. And yes, you have to do it, 
but like here's a way forward. Stuff like that seems like needed for sure. And there's a way to do it sort of be play a really hero's role in a lot of people's lives if you if you can help manage that kind of situation. Do we see any ideas uh, along that idea or anything like that? Yeah, I think there's something there, especially as it relates to maybe uh, an overarching, oh, you know, what we talked about earlier with helping companies adjust to, to working remotely. I think there's also a need in that same vein for helping companies downsize, whether it's temporary or larger than that. You know, because some, you know, we've seen some uh, here in Nashville, a couple of major hotels have said, look, we're, we're closing until June. That's the earliest we're going to know something. And so that's, you know, hundreds of people that they've had to let go. And we you know, obviously were just talking about SBA loans. There's a whole paycheck program where if you keep people on payroll, they basically will forgive that portion of the loan. And so that's one thing we're looking into in lieu of furloughing people. Can we keep paying them for eight to 12 weeks and have uh, basically for free. Uh, again, I'm not the expert, so I need to read more. But even helping people understand that, I mean, so you mentioned layoffs. We talk about culture. The qu- the comment we just got was about these SBA loans. I mean, there's so much coming at everybody so quickly. Just helping a small business owner or larger business owner navigate this uh, is in itself a valuable service. I think the question is, though, is there a competitive advantage of something like, I mean, existing accounting firms and stuff like that do this stuff all the time already? So it's really just behooves them to take the time and invest in becoming an expert on this and then getting themselves out in front of the appropriate people versus somebody's like kind of new and getting into the game where they're deciding to niche on this for the first time without necessarily having that customer base already of clients out there. I don't necessarily know that it's a... If I was going to start a business based at this point right now, I would want to pivot into the direction of how is this going to impact a longer term? Sorry to interrupt, but just in the interest of getting us to an idea here that maybe we all kind of have some uh, some connection with, or at least you guys do. A couple of the comments I'll throw back in. Chris Lacey said, the cooking side of things, create TV on NPR and online for learning. Chris Lacey also said, actually, the discussion is giving him business idea of his own, even though we're still tossing around possible ideas, the conversation is appreciated and useful. So that's, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. great. Yeah, share but, those ideas, Chris. Comment them, <laughs> yeah. we'll start kicking them around. But, but, but I think the one thing that, that's coming back to me that I was thinking of earlier is going back to that people like the Nona cooking, right? And we were talking about online learning and how there's a space for that. And this has come up with Chris and me on the podcast a few times that there's so many little niches that people can get to, like say within personal finance alone, you know, you're the personal finance for women, you know, the personal finance for people between the ages of 20 and 30 or whatever, and you can still be successful. However, you got to know all the ins and outs of building that community and, you know, keeping in touch with them. So what if it was like a platform where it was like, cause people love cooking shows. Oh my God. I don't know why they just sit there and watch somebody make a cake for an hour, you know, but they love cooking shows. But what if you help facilitate those people who had that personality, who had that recipe, loved connecting with people, but really didn't know the ins and outs of creating like their own TV show around it, right? And you help them create like an online presence. They can have their own little following and they do like weekly cooking classes where, you know, you get to tune in and they've got, and they actually get to know people a lot better than you would on your traditional cooking TV show, build an audience, build connections and do that kind of marketing around that. That's interesting. This makes me think of it like it's almost like a, a QVC. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> QVC would bring on, you know, inventors of different products and then they help make them into like multiple product launches because they found like the right person. And QVC actually just had the infrastructure there. They had the studio, the lights, the makeup, they had all the people to help script and craft the message. And it was mainly like kind of like what Chris said about the talent scout almost. So it's building a business around finding the right person with the right eye of recognizing who are the the nonas that can really resonate with a particular audience while they're also building that audience of people that they can then turn around and market every talent that they find to. Just curious how much we know about that actual ad that we saw on Facebook. I didn't see it when I say we, but one of us saw it. Um, <laughs> did it look like that was driven by the Nona or is that like her grandkids or like who is putting out that marketing campaign or is it like a service like we're talking about? 
And how do they know you so well, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> how do they know you so well? <laughs> I know we're short on time, but I have to share this story because it came up. And I think we're going to start drilling down on this idea some more. So it's appropriate. And I can say it quickly. A friend of mine's grandparents, the grandma made really great pizza. And the grandpa was so proud of it that he convinced the grandma to go into Whole Foods, set up a sample stand like they do for the products that they actually sell and have people try their pizza. <laughs> and then, then they would try it. They'd be like, oh, this is great. Where can I buy it? And then the grandpa was like, well, you can't buy it here yet, but go tell them that they have to start stocking it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. Like ninja, the ninja yeah. move right there, man. I like it. I love it. <laughs> Chris Baraji had a comment here I want to read. I think even if you have the recipe, you aren't going to get a following without charisma or personality. So at least one listener is reinforcing our thought process on selection for these people that are going to be putting courses up. Yeah. And that's why I think what you would want is it's sort of like probably any other talent base. So, you know, authors, music, acting, where you've got a thousand of them, but only three are really going to be that top echelon. And so maybe the the value prop is, is I, as the customer, pay a monthly subscription to get a catalog of a thousand chefs whose restaurants aren't fully open or small makers, if we stick in the food space, who make great seasoning sauces, etc. And one of those is really charismatic. And he or she may have 50 videos that are all awesome. They have a big menu. I want to cook everything that they do. They're fun to watch. But the others, maybe this is just the best you know, bacon that I've ever had. And the guy's kind of boring, but fantastic bacon and I can make it at home. That's fine too. And so the thing that you would then rely on your library because you're not trying to find 100 top-notch stars. You just need one or two who carry it. And then the rest are there for the taking as well. And based on, again, what, what you eat, what you like to make at home, you'll find something when your catalog gets big enough. So I'll throw in a challenge question that we may not have the answer to, but some of these smaller folks, it's hard for me to imagine that 84-year-old grandma has a lot of money to pay the producer. And the producer, is the talent scout, is going to have to take a chance on uh, people without enough from payment. Do you think that that business model can still work? Or how would you, how do you think about the business model, the financials with this idea? Yeah, I was thinking about that already. My, like my strategy with this to make it, to kind of bootstrap it would be to begin in a single market in a single region with a specific niche, maybe like cooking or local restaurant, like celebrity chefs or something Mm -hmm. like that and approach the ones that have the biggest following on their own. So you're kind of, especially before you have your own audience, you're leveraging the audience of the businesses that already have it, kind of market out to there. And then you're connecting the dots between like one celebrity chef to the next. And that allows you to kind of build up from there with a minimal risk on the investment side. I got to jump in with a crazy idea (laughs) that's building off this. So integrating our earlier discussion about how people are changing their habits right now, a lot of people are becoming more comfortable using Zoom. What if you had a nightly service where you ship everyone the ingredients and you set up the iPad and you're like, we're going to cook this together. This Nona is going to read you and tell you exactly what you need to do. You're going to follow along live. Everyone is doing this. We're making this meal in real time. We'll have an admin there to answer any questions if there are any hiccups. For you, that can be something that I imagine that in a time like this, especially people can, you have an opportunity to get into people's habits, right? And it does tie in that uh, expertise. You, you're the curator still. So you can have different chefs that you use. I think that's a really interesting way to differentiate it too from any other like meal kit service that just delivers with the recipe and to differentiate from like a Skillshare where you pay a monthly subscription and then you can just choose whatever you want. Because those kind of cater towards a specific customer who's very uh, motivated to go on there and actually search out for what they want and follow through with the whole course. Giving it that sense of kind of urgency and personalization of this being like a live cast, the celebrities in your kitchen with you is a really good angle. And also really, I think, timely to what's going on right now as people are much more familiar with Zoom. And then that's the um, opportunity of the moment. And whether that's, that's a premium fee is because, yeah, you say, look, on, on April 15th, the nation is cooking this with this chef. Because like, what, what else are you doing that night? There's no game on TV. There's nowhere. You're... And so it gives you something collectively 
to do, which I think would be pretty cool. And if you can't make it, then it's, you know, cataloged and you can do it later. But the fact that, yeah, you, you pay your money up front and they should be the box. I think that's a hell of an upsell. That's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. That's a really cool idea. I was going to say, especially right now, people are lonely, literally, you know, and you know what, even though they're lonely now because of COVID, they're lonely (laughs) anyways, they're just realizing that the imminence of it. And so like, yeah, it's kind of sounds like a fun idea to have like a big group. We're cooking, we're eating together, we're having a meal together. You could even have like a special feature where you can, you know, invite somebody into like a private table and have a little conversation with them, you know, because I know Zoom has like breakout rooms and stuff like that. And then you could go back to the big group and, you know, talk to everybody or invite like a little table of five and, and just eat and commiserate and, you know, enjoy company with people. I think that's that is a trend that preceded COVID, right? We're in an increasingly more connected world. Everybody can see everything that everybody's doing on social media and Instagram, which only kind of exacerbates that feeling of loneliness. Like, oh, look at all of the mm-hmm. awesome times that this person is having and I'm not a part of it. And now with the moment, like everybody posting pictures of their Zoom happy hours with all their friends from everywhere. And it's like, well, I don't yeah. have a happy hour to go to. <laughs> well, and, and, and that, that's even the piece of I me. Mean, Ethan, you bring up a good point where, again, I just think, keep thinking of the revenue model of this. And that's the ultimate upsell is that I get a private table with the chef 30 minutes before, 30 minutes after. So for 500 bucks or something, I'm getting one-on-ones to ask about you know, pots and pans to use or cooking utensil recommendations. You know, politicians have done this, I think, before raise money. You get a one-on-one call. And so if I get to ask specifically about this meal we're about to or just cook with six of my friends, uh, and that's a pretty killer kind of digital experience. You can also expand this beyond cooking, right? So if you had an artist or a musician, let's all learn this song together. That might be hard on Zoom, but maybe people go on mute and then you practice through it and you you work through it live with someone. Yeah, I think that there are a lot of different industries that you could tap into. That's huge. And that's something that we always struggled with at Tech Shop and I tried to think about is because is scale, right? We only ever, you know, we only ever had two MIG welders so that you could only run a class that maybe had four people in it, maybe six unless it got even more, the more people you add, the more superficial it has to be in order for anybody to have any level of value, take any level of value for the class. But now things have changed so much. There's so many maker spaces everywhere that have some of the uh, like very similar equipment. This could even branch into that where it's, you can put together these classes that are at many, many different locations and you have this ability to scale that was not really possible. Well, especially with those sorts of things, I mean, I mean, cooking, I think, is a great entry point. But I mean, again, just uh, all the hobbies, uh, language learning, uh, all these things that you never had time for. Theoretically, you've got time for them now. Now, if you change your behavior, that's that's an individual motivation. But think about everything from uh, gardening, especially now that the weather's getting warmer. Like we could make a list of 100 different skills that people have probably wanted to learn that, look, maybe I don't have the budget for whatever reason to pay the top fee for the gardener that is well known, but the guy who runs a local garden center who can't be open right now, he's got just as much expertise and his class is only 20 bucks. And so I'll take his out of the plant for the season versus the world famous gardener with the book, uh, just because it's a budget issue, but his stuff is just as good. Video is not as polished, but uh, it still gives me something to do in my time. And so that's why I think you've got, it's worth having the great charismatic, well-polished videos, as well as kind of the lower end entry level that I just want to learn this, the content. I was going to bring up one more thing here, though. Interesting point that's coming up here when you're talking about local business owners. You know, a lot of people, businesses are not scalable. You know, they just got a local business and, you know, they start to realize year after year they're doing everything and they don't have the scalable business that they thought they did. And one interesting positive aspect, if people do take the initiative to get online and do something like teach classes around what they do or build an audience around what they do, Oh my gosh, all of a sudden you've got something that's actually scalable and that's that's pretty powerful. And if the situation forced you to do that, again, people some people won't pick that up. But that could be an interesting collateral outcome. So people who didn't think they could have a scalable business all of a sudden they get online and now they realize what they can do that's scalable. All right, Chris, put us back on track. <laughs> back on track. I'll let you guys think about actions for a second here. I'm gonna read some comments. Chris Lacey said, sending of the ingredients can be outsourced, like choosing a specific HelloFresh recipe to use and cook it together over video, like a cooking and wine where the value added is the shared experience. 
I think that's what we're diving into here. He also commented, applies to the painting and wine classes. It's a social experience. I'm in a quarantine 2020, hashtag quarantine 2020 group where people are post to join each other for sharing dinner together. And then Andy Ellis commented, what about personal trainers and fitness classes run by local gyms for those that don't have a Peloton bike at home? So yeah, turn it back to you guys for some actions here. What are some of the things that people can do to investigate this idea, make a little bit of progress on it and get it going? Matt, I think Matt's point about picking starting in a certain city or region is, is the best way to do it. So I think anybody out there, if you're in, I think, you know, any size city where, again, the restaurants are either takeout only or just decided to close completely. I think if you reach out to those owners or chefs or whoever's behind the, in the kitchen there, reach out to 10 of them and say, here's what I'm thinking. Because I think, you know, we say this, I'm not in a restaurant or works in a restaurant. I don't know any, anything, but to show, just to see gauge interest. And, and that's where I think the best business idea is starting is saying, do I have that talent supply? What would they want to earn? What what could they offer? And sort of just do that legwork. But I think that in the afternoon, again, what are these people doing right now? So you should be able to reach them, have these conversations, ask the questions. And if you've had 10 of them to start, then again, even though they're not super polished, you can get them with today's phones and iPads and Zoom. Like They'll be good enough just to see. I think that's the first step is, is do you have talent for the pipeline? That's 100% the first step, I would say, is you reach out like do some research, find out who the local celebrity chefs are, the the biggest restaurants, look at their social media followings and their regularity of like putting out content digitally, start reaching out to those guys, start having the conversations, see what they're willing to accept. Even if it's just like an unpaid test run at first, just to say, okay, this will be fun. You're bored. But I think I think what's cool about this idea too is you can find the celebrity, you know, the folks who already have a following, absolutely. But then also like the whole wall barbecue joint that everybody loves, but that guy's never been on TV. People, you know, they've got, especially now, I've seen so many, uh, so much outpouring for supporting those local restaurateurs as they're just trying to survive until someday. So even finding those, because, you know, wanting to learn just the, tacos from the the place up the street that everybody goes to in town is also pretty cool for that market. It may not play nationally or globally like the the well-known folks will, but locally you could have some folks ready to throw down 10 bucks to learn how to make this taco sauce that that uh, everybody goes to on Friday nights or whatever. I'm thinking of myself locally here in Chicago. We've got Alinea which is a you know, a really famous restaurant. And uh, yeah, it's just like he's the chef's really well known. It's got a really interesting story. Just reach out to people like that. Their restaurant's closed and say, yeah, I want to get you on and I'll help help you put together the audience. I'll help you get everything going and, and you just got to cook and I'll tell you how to set up a camera and we'll do our best, right? So um, those are really great steps. And it, it, a point came up here, which I don't think a lot of people are realizing. If you ever wanted to connect with anyone, you know, over anything, and especially when they're in a business that just totally dropped off right now, then you've got a great opportunity to reach out. And, and especially if you can help them in some way. I was going to say, I have some friends who work in the bar and restaurant industry. And a lot of these restaurants are, are struggling now to start and build their communication channels to just let people know that you can still order from them. Here's how you do it. Here's how you pick it up or we deliver or all of these sorts of like logistical issues right now that they're just struggling to put in place out of an emergency. It provides a real opportunity if you can actually help them solve it when you reach out. Kind of to Sam's point earlier, it's like if you can do something that's timely that benefits them right now, that's the best way to reach out. So we're coming up on time here. We're going to have the final question for you guys, which is what is one thing you want our listeners to take away from this conversation? It can be a the guiding principle or you know, a general piece of philosophy, piece of advice. I'll let you guys think on that for a little bit here while I read a couple of comments. Chris Lacey, some gyms are renting out their equipment for the duration and hosting all of their instructor-led classes online via Zoom or other video platform. And he also mentioned that the local DC celebrity chef is Jose Andres, who is even busier right now. I think in my local independent diner around the corner, who everyone knows might be approachable. <laughs> That's interesting. I also wanted to throw in here, it's a little bit of foreshadowing. The next guest that we have is David Denny. He's going to be coming on in a few minutes. He told me the other day when we were chatting that his brother in New York is leading um, 
Zoom dance parties. And there he is. <laughs> uh, Alex Denny has been, I think he had 200 people on his last dance party. So it's not just chefs that are out there, uh, DJs, right? They, it's really difficult to do the work that they do when everyone's quarantined. So listeners, think about who out there is not able to connect with their customers right now and think about some ways in which you can incorporate some of the ideas that we've talked about and, and run with it. Let us know what you've done. Email us at update at runwithit.fm telling us what you have done. Coming back to you, Matt, what's one thing you would like our listeners to take away from the conversation? I think the my big takeaway is right now, even in spite of everything being, it's easy to dwell on the negative and to feel hopeless, but there's always opportunity and recognizing and being uh, appropriate as to what the opportunity is right now, what your customer needs and getting started and starting small. That's, that would be my takeaway. That's a great piece of advice. Sam. Yeah, I, I would say, uh, you will never be this not busy again in terms of not having a commute and just those little time wasters that happen maybe at the office. And so how are you using that time? Again, if you've used the last week or two to just chill out on and, and watch TV, fine. But start finding something in your day to improve. And I, I think for especially this audience, it is. If you've heard an idea in an hour, hour or at any time today, just start doing that those small steps and take what would have been your commute to talk to... 10 chefs and see if this idea has any merit or whatever that idea that you have always had on the shelf, take it off, dust it off. And uh, now's the time to try something for that. So cherish this time because very soon we'll look back in this and be like, man, what did I do? Oh, I watched Tiger King twice. Uh, so I <laughs> finding, finding something more productive is my encouragement. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to learn seven languages. Just do something. Well, that, that's great. I'm glad you brought that up, Sam. Our previous guest, one of our previous guests last hour, Peter Corbett had, he asked the question, 10 years from now, what will you tell your friends or your kids what you did during the <laughs> pandemic, what you did to help? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, how you use your time in general, I think that's uh, that's a great thing to reflect on. So thank you guys very much for the time that you've shared here with us. If you have the time and are interested, you're welcome to hang on to uh, to chat with David here as we're coming up on the next hour. If not, yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Um, that's totally fine. Welcome to sign off and, and appreciate the conversation again. Yeah, thank you guys. For sure. Cool. For sure. Thanks for having us. This was a blast. Sure thing. I'll hang on for a bit. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Sit tight. Just uh, Just go ahead and shelter in place right there and... <laughs> now it's time for you to run with it follow through on the action steps discussed and email a summary of what you did to update at runwithit.fm every listener who emails us will gain exclusive access to a private facebook group of action takers and one listener will earn a free mentoring session with today's guest and potentially a business partnership help us build the run with it community of generous entrepreneurs please like subscribe and review us online and remember the secret of getting ahead is getting started